So this morning's reading, the Joy Harjo poem, came to me earlier this week when the last thing I felt like doing was praising the rain. <laughs> Did I hear an oh yeah? <laughs> but it's easy to praise the sunshine, right? This is what prayer asks of us, to praise, or at least to face head on something we might rather condemn or curse. Perhaps, like many of you, I have not always had a relationship with prayer. I have not always understood how or if it would ever be useful to me. See, I was raised in a humanist, staunchly humanist UU congregation in Chicago. I don't think I ever even heard the words, let us pray, once throughout my childhood in Chicago's west side. That may sound amazing to a room full of Southerners, <laughs> but I don't believe I ever heard those three words. It wasn't until I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee for middle school and high school then that I experienced, honestly, social persecution because I did not attend the prayer meetings at the flagpole before school. I didn't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, which was somehow related to me, to a Christo-nationalism that I proudly rejected. And I didn't join the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, though I was a starting varsity athlete, nor did I join Young Life, the Christian youth group of the popular and the beautiful. Instead, oh yeah, someone else relates. <laughs> Instead, proclaiming my humanism, I spent my lunch hour organizing letter writing campaigns to, interna to free international political prisoners in my role as president of our school's chapter of Amnesty International. <laughs> Meanwhile, at home, my family of six gathered for a raucous, politically engaged home-cooked dinner seven nights a week. Even though my mother was in seminary, we never ever prayed. Hmm. Nor did we observe basic table manners. <laughs> but the gathering, she's hopefully not watching, but the gathering of the family was sacrosanct. We were allowed many freedoms as teenagers. One rule above them all, don't miss family dinner. Looking back, while I appreciate the ritual of our gathering, I wonder if we missed something by never praying. How might it have changed the quality of our dinner discussions, which were the laboratory in which our ever-evolving identities and opinions were tested? I did not pray, not really, until I eventually faced my own deep struggle with multiple miscarriages and the hellish uncertainty of fertility's race against time. Even then, it was mostly a confusing, desperate request for intervention of some kind, some great hand to reach down into the anxiety spiral I had fallen into that might pull me back out or at least throw me a rope. Then, in seminary, I really learned to pray. I mean, the form of it, the proper way to address a deity but it was all fumbling and foreign. I didn't become comfortable with prayer until chaplaincy, when before leaving every single hospital bed, every pastoral encounter, my supervisor required us to offer, at least offer, a custom-made prayer. It was the rigor of repetition it required deep wells of creativity to custom make prayer for a religiously diverse population. This was in the Lower East Side of Manhattan at Beth Israel Hospital, praying for atheists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholics, secular humanist Jews, and evangelical Christians, sometimes in Spanish, but always oriented as a Unitarian Universalist. That experience is what changed my relationship to prayer, and it is now a part of my daily life. See, prayer is an expression 
of the soul's deepest desire, the imagination's power to push boundaries, break out of paradigms of what you see in front of you. Prayer is a chance to sink in and really listen to what desire is deeper and more central to who you are and what you are here to do with your one wild and precious life. Prayer can be intercessory, inter asking for someone or something to intercede. It can offer gratitude or express awe and wonder at the mystery of life. I think of the act of prayer similar to the expression of love. There are so many kinds of love. I was thinking about it this Valentine's Day week. Love of music or art. There's love of a hobby or a sport. Love of the natural world. Love does not require a partner. You need not be in a romantic relationship to be romantic, to feel or to express love. Prayer is like this, too. Unitarian Universalist minister and theologian Forrest Church used to say, tell me about the God you don't believe in, because I'm sure I don't believe in that God either. <laughs> and so in case you are sitting out there wondering if I pray to a bearded man sitting on a throned cloud, well, that is not even close. <laughs> Let me be clear. When someone does find comfort in Father God, I respect and I honor their beautiful belief. But the object of my prayer is a shapeshifter, taking on the attributes I may need in a given moment. Redeemer, mother, mystery, universe, father, friend, comforter, steadfast mountain, deep canyon, and on and on. Even when I pray an intercessory prayer, I pray for something that is possible. I will not pray for someone to be miraculously healed. That's not a promise I can make, but I will pray for the doctors to be wise and holistic in their thinking, for all the healthcare professionals to do their absolute best, most careful and most caring work for this patient. I will pray for deepest comfort and expansive peace for the person undergoing the procedure and for their family. Now, like most human ideas, prayer certainly can be weaponized. Perhaps you become nervous or defiant when we mention prayer in worship. Perhaps it is because someone has prayed for your soul against your will. Perhaps they prayed for your soul to get into their version of heaven. Perhaps they used their prayer as a way to burn a bridge, end an argument, or gain a sense of moral superiority. I was heavily prayed for when I lived in Tennessee. <laughs> it's true. At first, I was outraged. How dare they pray for me? Eventually, I became grateful, and that was the most disarming. I mean, I was glad they didn't want me to burn in hellfire forever. That was sweet of them. I remember when the UU General Assembly, all the gathering of thousands of Unitarian Universalists, was held in Salt Lake City, Utah, and swarms of us checked out the great library of ancestors the Mormons keep there, where they keep records of every American so they can posthumously pray for them to enter heaven. It is soul colonizing. It is infuriating. The way they do this even for Jews, for atheists, for Muslims, for people with radically different versions of an afterlife. I do not believe in weaponizing prayer. However, I have found my own peace with being prayed for. And now, today, this minister will accept all your prayers gratefully. <laughs> prayer can be subversive. One of my favorite subversive prayers is the Seventh-day Adventist Senate chaplain, Reverend Admiral Barry Black. Did you know the Senate has a chaplain? 
He was elected to the office of Senate chaplain in 2003, where he continues to serve, and, and he gave the opening prayers for the recent impeachment trial. I loved his prayers during one of the most divisive moments in the Senate's history, the 16-day United States federal government shutdown of 2013. On October 1st, that was the first day of the shutdown, he prayed for, I'm going to quote, for divine guidance to strengthen our weakness, replacing cynicism with faith and cowardice with courage. Did he just call the senators weak, cynical, and cowardly? I do believe he did. <laughs> On October 3rd, day three of the government shutdown, he prayed, save us from this madness. We acknowledge our transgressions, our shortcomings, our smugness, our selfishness, our pride. Deliver us from the hypocrisy of attempting to sound reasonable while being unreasonable. <laughs> Ooh, that is what the kids call a sick burn. <laughs> this prayer was subversive. It was powerful. It was, in fact, the only moral voice in the room calling for higher standards of commitment and ethical behavior. It was a voice that held special power because many of the hypocrites he referenced would use religion as their basis for cynical power plays. He was using his prayer to interpret a faith that would transcend political maneuvering in favor of a more just and higher functioning government. He continued with his subversive prayers each day of the shutdown. They became harsher and more pointed as time went on, so much so that his prayers were parodied on Saturday Night Live by Kenan Thompson. This was an expression of his truth, his truth and his inner desires that could not be expressed any other way. In her poem, Praise the Rain, Joy Harjo offers gratitude for all of life's experiences. She praises not only the sun, but also the rain, like poetry. Like sacred scriptures, prayer can be a container for all of life's complexities. Harjo writes, praise crazy, praise sad, praise the path on which we're led, praise the roads on earth and water, praise the eater and the eaten, praise beginnings, praise the end. Praise the song and praise the singer. Sure, but do you? Do you praise crazy? Do you praise sad? Do you reserve your gratitude only for the things you deem to be good? You are missing out if you do. You are missing out on the relief that can come after the lament or the lament itself, an expression of anger or fear or sadness that was deeper than you ever knew. No recipient needed. Harjo does not tell us to pray for rain, but praise the rain when you see it. Praise crazy, praise sad. Our need for life to always be good, always be even keel, well, that can hold us back from deeper expression, deeper pain and self-knowledge, deeper love and connection to the self, to something greater and each other. In her little book, Help Thanks Wow, the writer Anne Lamott breaks prayer down into three categories. She writes about how prayer often begins and ends with a plea for help amidst desperation. She writes, there's a lot to be said for having really reached a bottom where you run out of any more good ideas or plans for everybody else's behavior or how to save and fix and rescue or just how to get out of a huge mess possibly of your own creation. And when you're done, you may take a long quavering breath and say, People say help 
without actually believing anyone hears that. But it is the great prayer, and it is the hardest prayer, because you have to admit defeat. You have to surrender, which is the hardest thing any of us ever do. That's Anne Lamott. If you have known desperation, then you may have looked into the vast sky and asked it for help. You may have held a rosary in your life and asked it for help. You may have held a hand tighter than you meant to and offered to it the gift of your desperation. Help. Next, Lamott explains the second kind of prayer. Thanks is the prayer of relief, that help was on the way. It can be the pettiest, dumbest thing, but it could also be that you get the phone call, that the diagnosis was much, much, much better than you had been fearing. The full prayer and its entirety is, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but for reasons of brevity, I just refer to it as thanks. <laughs> Again, no recipient needed. If I'm honest about how we today, the Strauss Richards, became a praying family holding hands around a dinner table with my two young boys and saying thanks, I have to say it is because of my Episcopalian spouse, whose steadfast and very private prayer life was always a marvel to me. He used to tell me, it's not a genie or a birthday cake designed to grant me a wish, it's just a relationship. And so, always the chivalrous one, he never forgets his manners and always says thank you. I hope my children will tap into gratitude throughout their life. And whatever their life holds in the moment, even when it is at its hardest and its scariest, I hope they can still access gratitude and say thank you. That is the discipline of gratitude, to connect to gratitude even when your life feels scarce confusing, even when it has been touched by death, when nothing makes sense or feels meaningful at all. That's Joy Harjo's poem speaking to us again. Praise the hurt, the house slack, she tells us. It's the most difficult thing to do. Prayer can cut into senselessness for me. It's like putting one foot in front of the other, stepping out of loss. The third kind of prayer Lamont explores is the wow prayer. Lamont writes, wow is the praise prayer. You've said it before, let me hear it now. The prayer where we're finally speechless, which in my case is saying something. <laughs> when I don't know what else to do, I go outside and I see the sky and the trees and a bird flies by and my mouth drops open again with wonder at just the sheer beauty of creation, and I say, wow. You say it when you see the fjords for the first time at dawn, or you say it when you first see the new baby, and you say, wow, this is great. Wow is the prayer of wonder. I remember one summer, we were at the beach with my family and friends watching a spectacular meteor shower, and the adults <clears throat> much to my teenage embarrassment and that of my sisters, the adults started rounds of applause at the largest meteors. They were laughing, they were wowing, they were giddy with awe. For me, it's not enough to feel wonder, nor gratitude, nor desperation. It is the expression of those parts of life, giving them voice and energy and weight so they can impact my life, little by little and lend reflective meaning to my days. For me, I can have faith in something greater than me without knowing it exists. I can pray without certainty of God's presence. For the rationalist, for the humanist, for the atheist, I say prayer is also for you. Some of you may know Sean Golan, who hopefully is coming to the second service. <laughs> he grew up a UU right here at UUCA his whole life, and he now serves on our board of trustees and in our young adult group. Well, years ago, I learned that Sean 
wrote a personal Unitarian Universalist humanist companion to the Lord's Prayer. This has been meaningful for him since he wrote it, and I offer it, I share it with you now with his permission. O oh, universe, greater than all of us combined, which we sanctify with our thoughts and deeds, let me know that in the end we will all see and understand each other. Help me accept and embrace this day and be thankful for the life I am blessed with. Help me remember we all make mistakes and we are all imperfect. Help me be strong enough to let my frustrations and anger go with my breath. Help me forge the path forward through forgiveness and resist the temptations of vindictiveness and self-righteous judgment. Help me. Help remind me to use my thoughts and actions to further my understanding and to lift myself and others up by bringing more love into the world. Amen. May it be so.